clear. There was nothing immoral about their relationship at all. It was absolutely wholesome. And the love that they had for one another was closer than that of brothers. Jonathan's own political father was doing everything he could to kill David, and yet Jonathan's heart was knit to David. David couldn't even expose himself, so Jonathan went out in the field and knocked an arrow on his bow. It was already predetermined. The distance that I shoot the arrow will determine what you should do, David. If I shoot it short, you can come back. If I shoot it long, Dad still wants to kill you. Jonathan sent the boy out to retrieve the arrow. Jonathan knocked the arrow, put it in his bow, and he drew it back and aimed it as high as he could and pulled as far back, and he shot. Go, David, go. They're trying to kill you. He's got the whole kingdom in an uproar against you. I love you, David. Go. Flee. Let God get you out of this situation. David left. He didn't even have a chance to take any weaponry with him. He goes to the faithless priest Ahimelech's house. You'd think, I can go to a Christian. I can go to somebody who believes the word of God. Maybe I can find a cleft in the rock hiding place, a refuge in the time of storm. But Ahimelech was afraid to be associated with David because he knew Saul would be next after him. Some type friend. I'm giving you the background of why David wrote Psalm. Are y'all still with me this morning? Yes. You ever walk into a room and it gets quiet? Who they've been talking about? I call it plastic or cardboard greeting, cheesy smile. <laughs> Who's been the subject of their previous conversations? You have. David leaves Ahimelech. You got any weaponry? I got this big sword. Oh, you remember, David. You used this sword one time. You took your brothers some food and this great big ugly guy over nine foot tall. You said, is there not a cause? You see, the Philistines wanted to change the rules of engagement. They wanted you, the weakest of Israel to fight the strongest. They cursed your God. You killed him. And you took that sword and decapitated him. Now, Goliath's nine foot six. Can you imagine how tall that sword was? I'm saying at least six foot tall. David puts that in his scabbard. He leaves. This thing's dragging a furrow behind him. I mean, it's obvious this wasn't a custom-made weapon for David, but it's all that he had. Somebody else was there at Ahimelech's place in 1 Samuel 21. His name was Doeg, D-O-E-G, Hebrew, Doeg, anxious. He was the chief of Saul's herdsmen. What was he anxious to do? To go tell Saul, I know where David's at. How I many of you see he could find no place of peace? How I many of you see that fear was everywhere? So he hastily leaves, he's got the sword, He's got to get away from Doeg before Doeg can go tell. And David goes to the town of Gath. He walks into Gath and the people are looking at him. The Philistines. Jewish. Then they see that big sword. Hey, are you? Yeah, you with a beard. Where'd you get that sword? Oh, this sword, said David? Oh, I killed the guy. You know, great big, big, he's an ugly guy. Yeah, I didn't rock right in the head. Cut off his head. Gath was Goliath's hometown. You all still with me this morning? 
This is called jumping out of the frying pan and landing in the fire. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Now everybody's against him. This is in your Bible where David started acting mentally disturbed. I do that with my wife sometimes. She hates now to go shopping with me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. She hates for me to go shopping with her. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you. It took me several years to think of this one. We go into the store, I'd hold her hand, walk like this. She goes, stop that stuff. Don't beat me no more, Mary. I promise I'll be good. Just don't hit me no more. She doesn't want me to go shopping with her anymore. <laughs> this is in your Bible where David started acting mentally disturbed. He let spit run down his beard and scrabbled on the doors. Oh, they wanted to kill him, but when they say, hey, 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 just go. I sought the Lord. He heard me. He delivered me from all my fears. God delivers from fear. Number one, fears are on every side. Take your Bible, turn if you would, to Psalm chapter 56 and verse number three. They are behind you, they are in front of you, they are to your left and right and beneath. Your courage to conquer fear will not come from any of those directions, but rather from above. You must look up to him and his word by faith before fear takes hold of you. Psalm 56, verse number three. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Last October, we were in Israel, one of my special ops trips. Had a handful of men, all independent Baptists. Most of them have either been in special forces in the United States, are on SWAT teams, all, most all police officers or retired. So on the last day, I always give even the special ops a tour of Jerusalem. And I noticed the Temple Mount was open. So I went over to the Jerusalem police. All our guys flashed our badges. They recognized, we know who you are. Brother Sharp said, can you get me up on the temple now? Eh, a little uneasy right now. And I said, for you? Yes. Now those Muslims up there are going to verbally attack you. All right, we can handle it. Well, some of my guys were wearing their Gentile ministry T-shirts. I told them, don't wear it if we get up on the temple mount. Because if there's innocent, I don't, I'm not afraid but I'm afraid of innocent people getting hurt. Don't wear it, just, they wore it anyway. One of them had Rob Schott's shirt on. Now, Rob Schott's a watchman on the wall. He protects an Israeli village. He is sworn under oath. When a Palestinian terrorist tries to get into that village, the Rob Schott has to take him out. And if there's 50 of them, the Rob Schatz has to go against all 50, and the Rob Schatz is usually the first one killed. He's the most courageous man in Israel that I know. And I know 100 of them, and walk them into all of their homes. So one of my guys got his Rob Schatz. It's in Hebrew. We go up on the Temple Mount, here comes some terrorists. Confirmed just days later. And I knew it from the beginning, no? Stop, stop! I said, just keep going. Do not stop. Stop, stop! They separated my guys. You cannot wear that T-shirt up on the temple. Mount. He's speaking perfect English. He's an Arab. Now, I had just walked by the place. There's no sign or anything, but I know from studying the scriptures, it's exactly where Jesus overthrew the money changers' tables. And he got angry that day. It's all right to be angry. Just don't sin after you get angry. Be ye angry and sin not. You ought to get angry against sin. You ought to get angry against things trying to break up your marriage. You ought to get angry against things trying to get you out of the will of God. Be ye angry, just don't sin when you get angry. So I just walked past that and I went, yes. We get up on the Temple Mount, here comes the terrorist. You can't wear those t-shirts! 
You're blaspheming my Allah. Allah doesn't even exist. I picked the big one out and I just looked at him. One of your men was cursing. I said, you're a liar. He didn't curse. You Americans think you know everything. Just looked at him. You must take those shirts off. We're not taking anything off. Your men are going to go individually into one of these rooms and they're going to take their shirt off or turn it inside out. I said, nobody's going anywhere individually. We're not taking their shirt off and we're not turning it inside out. What does that say on the back of his shirt? I said, do you read Hebrew? Yes. I said, then you say it. Amen. Amen. Were you afraid, Brother Sharp? Jesus wasn't afraid. I'm standing on the same spot. Yeah. Oh, they got violent and wild. And then the Jerusalem Police Department came over, about 20 of them. And they said, they're not taking their shirts off, they're not turning them inside out, and you Arabs are under arrest. And then we got a personal tour <laughs> of the Temple Mount. Were you afraid? No. Why? I kept quoting Psalm 56, 3. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. You remember when we went bear hunting? I don't know if it was the time, that, I don't know if you were there when I had to shoot that bear point blank. Because I, I had no choice. I had to shoot it point blank. Brother Dan, that bear was coming. I could, for the life of me, I couldn't think of Psalm 56 3. <laughs> All that was going through my mind is an old song from 1910 about a preacher who skipped church and went bear hunting. And in the song, it's, Lord, if the bear caught him, and he's praying, Lord, if, if you can't help me, for goodness sake, don't help that bear. That's all I could think of. I'm glad God knew that song. Amen. <laughs> 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. One of these verses is going to work for your fear if not more than one. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. The Bible says the following. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Now, if God didn't give you that spirit of fear, who did? You either got it from yourself, somebody else, or the devil, but it didn't come from God but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor me as prisoner. Be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. I'm afraid to do something for God. God didn't give you that fear. But I admit, I'm not going to know what to say. The Holy Spirit will give you something to say. I can't think of anything. Then just stand there and go, you'll think of something the next time. But you have to realize you can't succumb to the fear because God didn't give you the fear. And you be armed with the Word of God so that the fear can be conquered in direction and service. Number two, fears come when an individual thinks they are in the grasp of the enemy. Moses and Pharaoh, Daniel in the lion's den, three Hebrew children in a fiery furnace, Joseph in the hands of his brethren as they're shredding or putting blood on his coat or dropping him in a pit, taking him out, selling him as a slave, Potiphar's house, thrown into prison, forgotten. Sometimes you see the enemy. God allows you to do that. The disciples saw a storm. 2 Timothy 3.11, you're close to this one, let's take a look at it. Persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra. What persecutions I endured. He quotes Psalm 34. Notice the last part, 2 Timothy 3.11. Paul says, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. All. Oh, no, Brother Sharp. All. But, Brother Sharp, I don't. All. But my situation is that 
all God delivers. God may allow you to recognize the potential for fear. He may allow you to see there is a possibility for great fear here before he delivers you, just so that after the fact, you have no doubt it was God who did it. It's not a sin to realize the opposition. Quite often it may be a prerequisite. You may have to see a Midianite army first. Big and yours go small. You may see a Goliath first. You may see the Amalekites and yourself as grasshoppers in their sight before God delivers you. Face your verse, face your fear with a verse and a passage of Scripture. Deal with it. Number three, what are your greatest fears? Deal with them, conquer them. The Lord delivered me from all my fears. I went through almost 50 radiation treatments for cancer a few months ago. When they did the, pro the uh, biopsy on the prostate, it's an embarrassing procedure. I'll not go into detail, but in my mind, I'm thinking they're going to go in and just take one piece. Now, that little machine they got is, uh, they looked at a mule and a snapping turtle and made this machine. <laughs> and I'm telling you, it goes in and it kicks hard and it bites hard. And I'm facing the wall in the pike position on my side, and wham, he hits me. Ooh. I mean, I may not be the toughest guy, but I get teeth pulled without any Novocaine or anything. I have root canals. I never get that stuff. Why? Well, I can save 15 bucks. <laughs> I can buy, get Bibles for that. That hurt. Mm. Man, I'm glad this one's over. By the time I thought that, bam, he did it again. I counted to seven, or I counted to five first, the number of grace. I said, Oh, I'm glad it's over. I looked, the doc said, Over, just a few more. Bam! He did it 16 times. Is there any prostate left? <laughs> By the time I am afraid, I'll trust in thee. As of right now, I'm testing cancer free, free for prostate. So I praise the Lord for that. Fear not is the most frequent command given by Jesus, number four. He said it more to the Jewish disciples than any other command. Fear not, fear not, fear not. Father, I have lost none of them. I will give you another comforter. Were they the part of the bride of Christ? Absolutely. The Pharisees complained because the Jewish disciples of Jesus didn't wash their hands or fast. And Jesus said, can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? Hello. They're part of the bride. They had him and he was in them and they in him. They had, Jesus said, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now when his physical presence departed, he gave them the reassurance that the Comforter would never leave them nor forsake them. And you have the same Comforter, the Holy Ghost of God. You have the same word that he can bring to your mind, but you have to see it and go find it, memorize it, so when the fear comes up, you can pray and quote it. Not that God needs to be reminded, but when you say, God, you said. How many, of you, how many of you daddies, your children come to you and said, but dad, you said, once you said, you better do. And God will. The most frequent command. Write Psalm 34, verse 19 through 22. That'll finish the chapter for you. And I'll tell this story and be done. Several years ago, I was on the Gaza border. Rockets were flying, whistling, embedded, teaching, on patrol. For a brief moment, we were able to gather 31 rob shots in one building. We couldn't tell anybody. It had to be over within 45 minutes. Through specific donations, I was able to enhance their bulletproof vest, give them some binoculars, 
let them see the enemy at night before the enemy saw them, and they were very thankful, very appreciative. And it's designated free will offerings that people say, I want this to go for. With each gift went a copy of God's Word. In that Hebrew Bible, I printed 26 prophecies pointing to Jesus Christ. Pasted it right in the front cover. Now there are enemies in Israel like there are enemies in the United States, like there are in your family, to the gospel. There's a group in Israel called Yad Lachim. They have a sound in their alphabet that we don't have. It's the coughing, hacking sound, like you're trying to get rid of a piece of sand. Yad Lachim. It means my brother's keeper. Yad, imagine the Ku Klux Klan in the 1930s. That's Yad Lachim. They're in every branch of government and business in Israel. They are anti-missionary, and I beg you don't use that word missionary. It's not in the Bible. It's not where we are. We didn't come from that. It's not a Baptist word. Use the Bible word messenger. That's consistent in the Old Testament, in the Gospels, and in the Epistles. We're always called messengers. They are anti-messenger. They will ferret you out and get you kicked out of the country. They are ruthless. One of our pastors, a knock on his door, the wife opened, a member of Yad Lachim in a black hood, opened a shoebox and threw a dozen lab rats on her. And each rat was infected with a communicable disease. Now, not everybody in Israel is like that. Okay, just like not everybody in your family is like that, but you've got people in your family that do stupid things. <laughs> not testimony time, I know you want it to be. <laughs> a member of Yad Lachim at that brief meeting with all the Rav Shatzim and Lieutenant Colonel opens the Bible to the prophecy page, takes a picture, closes, sneaks out, quickly has it published on the front page of the most ultra-Orthodox newspaper in Israel. My picture, the picture of the prophecies, this man is a proselyter. That's against the law in Israel, to try to convert people. That's a felony. He is nothing more than that one they called the Apostle Paul. He's giving gifts in exchange for conversion. That is not true. I've never given something in order for somebody to convert, and I don't give something when people are standing there with their hands out. I don't care who you are. Amen. Did I give? Yes. Did we give? Yes. I'll give the shirt off my back as long as you don't poor mouth it and ask me for it. As soon as I know you're working hard and you don't have a shirt, you can have mine. I'll open my wallet and give you everything that's in there. But not when you're trying to take advantage of me. Amen. Amen. So the newspaper had email returns. I'm still in this meeting preaching to these 31 Rob Shatzin. The emails came into the paper. First one, burn! his Bible. Second one, have him arrested. Third one, throw him in jail. Fourth one, fine him. Ban him from our country. Contact the Attorney General of Israel. Wow. And then this mighty army of Jews that I've won and witnessed and saved them physically too because they were wearing a protective vest and she was a first responder and there was a second bomb after the first one and the vest that we put on her caught the shrapnel. And another who was able to see the terrorist before the terrorist saw him because I gave them a pair of night vision goggles. And then the Jerusalem, oh, over a hundred emailed in to the newspaper. I know Mr. Sharp. He's on the front line, he's feeding our troops. He's giving out the word of God. You better leave him alone. Nothing bad happens when Brother Sharp is here. It's documented. 
No one gets killed in any of his units, or in, it's documented. We had 100 emails like that. I get out of the meeting, all I found out was the first 10. And then I get a phone call, it's a guy in London, England. Mr. Sharp, yes, this is, I won't say his name, from such and such Bible Society. You no longer have permission to pass out our Hebrew Bibles in Israel. You're causing too much controversy. You're on the front page. I said, I didn't ask your permission to pass out your Hebrew Bible. You contacted me, remember? All your Bibles were sitting in church closets and in people's garages and in their basements on the shelf collecting dust because you didn't have an endpoint user. You didn't have somebody that was actually talking to an Israeli person, giving them the Word of God. You're all lip service, bro, sitting behind a desk raising funds. We're the soldiers on the field. And now you tell me I don't have permission. I didn't ask your permission. You don't have permission. Then I get a call from some of the brethren. What are you doing wasting your time with the Jews? You know they killed Jesus and rejected him and been broken. You know what I felt like, Brother Manus? I felt like Uriah. I'm on the front line. I turned around and wasn't anybody. For about this long, I felt sorry for myself. First thing I did was got angry. I'm saying, all right, you're angry, don't sin. Well, if I could have got one of the, nah, don't sin. And I started feeling sorry. A little fear came in. Is this it, God? Ministry over? Am I going to get arrested and kicked out? Can't pass out the Bible? Then God said to me, I printed 26 of your prophecies about my son in 100,000 ultra-Orthodox newspapers on the front cover. Yes, oh. Are you listening? Yes, sir. Print your own Hebrew Bible. Well, I hadn't thought of that. So I found the copyright on the most pure Hebrew text from which our King James comes. And that was the one I was passing out. They too are in London, England. I call over. I'm talking to the guy. He said, you guys got the copyright on this. How much would it cost me for permission to print our own Hebrew Bible and put in whatever I want? He said, what happened? I said, well, I don't want He goes, oh, and he called the guy's name right down the road. They, yeah, we gave them permission, but uh, they don't do anything. We don't like them. I said, okay, you can have permission, Brother Sharp. I said, okay, how, how much? He goes, oh, I don't know. How about zero? zero. Wow. Well. <laughs> so I designed it. It's got seven seals on it. Print my own introduction. I sought the Lord. He heard me and delivered me from all my fears. What's your fear? You got it written down? Tear it up. But keep one of the verses. Last point. Where are you going to go when you die? Brother Sharp, I'm afraid of that one. I lay my head down on the pillow at night and I wonder if I don't wake up on this earth, where will I wake up? Sometimes I think I'm good. The truth is I know that I've done things that some people don't even know about, but God does. I don't want to go to hell, Brother Sharp. I don't want you going to hell. I don't go to heaven, Brother Sharp. I want you to go to heaven. I don't want to go to the lake of fire, Brother Sharp. God doesn't want you to go to the lake of fire. I want to be with God in the new Jerusalem. I want everything forgiven. God wants to forgive you and spend eternity with you in the new Jerusalem. But I'm afraid. You don't have to. You can have that settled right now. 
You can walk out of here and that fear will be gone. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you bless our invitation time. Heads about our eyes are closed. How many by way of uplifted hand would indicate, Brother Sharp, I am saved. In addition to being saved, there's a fear that haunts me. It comes, I'm being honest, it comes, I try to put it in the background, it keeps coming back. I want it conquered, I want to get the victory. I don't want to become proud because I've got the victory, but I do want to get the victory over this fear. Would you say a prayer for me, Brother Sharp? If that's you as a Christian, would you slip your hand up this morning? God bless you, God bless you, lots of hands. Praise the Lord, thank you, you may put it down. Would there be one or two here this morning or 10 that would say, Brother Sharp, I'm afraid of where I would go if I were to die, if I don't wake up on this mortal planet, I'm afraid where I might wake up. I do not want to go to punishment. I don't want to go to hell. I do want to end up in heaven. I would like all my sins forgiven so that I don't have to answer for them. Pray for me, Brother Sharp. I would like to get this fear conquered. I want to be saved and go to heaven when I die. Say a prayer for me, Brother Sharp, when you're praying for everybody else. If that's you, friend, slip your hand up and let me see it big and high. I want to go to heaven. God bless you, son. I'm afraid that I might go someplace else. God bless you. I'm afraid I would go to a place where God doesn't want me to go. I want to go to the good place. Pray for me, Brother Sharp. Who else? All right, those of you who just raised your hand, you're afraid of where you're going to go when you die. Would you lift your head and look at me? Nobody else is looking, but would you? During the invitation time, when people come forward, there'll be those standing in front of me. All you got to do is come and say, I'm afraid that I won't go to heaven, but I want to go to heaven. Somebody give you the verse of scripture in a few minutes time. You can leave here with your fear conquered. Let's stand, head up, eyes open, take a look at me. I'm going to pray. When I say amen, we'll just have music, no singing, so everybody can come. When you hear the piano start after I say amen, you Christians, lead the way. Come down here. Give your fear to God. Take his word back with you and leave here victorious. I sought the Lord. He heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Father, bless the invitation we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You come right now. Others are coming. How about you today? If the Lord spoken to your heart, there's many that raise that hand. Many have feared. Why not come? Why not submit? Why not seek God? He will deliver, deliver you out of all your fear. Let's do that. Run through that one more time. Brother Mike, let's sing that last stanza together. If God spoke to your heart, no matter who you are, if you don't know the Lord, one of our pastors are standing here. They'll take the Bible and show you how to know for sure that heaven's your home. As we sing, you step out today. Would you do that? Come every soul, my sin oppressed. There's mercy. the Lord. If you enjoyed yourself today, say amen. amen. Great message. Great, great truth. I mean, that hits home. That's where I live. And um, Satan is the author of fear. 
And we ask God to give us his great faith. And the word of God is our strength. Amen. I was telling someone this morning, it's like God says, cast our fear upon him. And, and it's like fishing. A lot of times we want to cast it, but we want to reel it right back in. And we've got to leave it, let, let it there. Leave it there for him and he'll take it. And I need that. I needed that. Thank you, Brother Sharp. Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for your goodness and your grace. And God, I trust in you. You are the creator of this universe, Lord. You are more than we can even imagine. We can even say we don't have the words, Lord. And if, if we could just grasp, Lord, at the tip of your finger, Lord, the might and the strength. And you have given us your spirit, the Holy Spirit, and we have your power. Greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. Father, I pray that we would understand, Lord, that you are our great God that takes away all of our fears. So bless today. We thank you. We praise you for it. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Hey, avail yourself to Brother Sharp's material. He's only here with us one moment, one time today, and thank him for coming. God bless you. Oh, I take 30 yes, seconds yes, to yes, the illustration. yes. I forgot to tell you what happened there on the front lines. The colonel of the entire Southern Command issued an order, leave Dr. Brian Sharp alone. He's welcome in every village down here. And then the guy who took the picture and put it in the paper, they withheld his funds from his community. So he called a lieutenant colonel and apologized. Lieutenant colonel called me and said he wants to apologize. I said, tell him I forgive him. Lieutenant colonel started to get mad at me. You forgive him for what? Why? I said, because one of his relatives forgave me. Yeah. Lieutenant Colonel said, who? I said, you know. <laughs> <laughs> God bless you. Is that good? Make sure you greet him and thank him for coming today. God bless you. Amen. Amen.